Hello, everybody, and welcome to SPSM Chat. Um, it, I am your host, Ashley J, here with my fellow co hosts, Nyla Burton and Dr. Crystal McLeod. And for today's discussion, we will be talking about how suicide prevention is more than just reaching out. So we will be doing a critical review of Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and our current suicide prevention efforts with our lovely panel panelist, uh, Dr. April Alexander, Desiree L. Stage, and Brandon J. Johnson. I'm really excited to get into this session with them. Um, but first, uh, let me give everybody a lay of the land. So if you're watching us from Twitter, um, please make sure to tweet us using the hashtag SVSM during the discussion. Uh, tweet us your questions, tweet us your comments. And if you're watching us from Facebook or YouTube, feel free to use the hashtag if you want to, if you want to be fancy like that, or you can just feel free to comment and ask questions. We'll also be posting questions on stream for our audience, um, such as this one. Yes, that's a question that we will be putting up for our audience members to answer um, as we are talking to our panelists. So feel free to respond to any of the questions that we put up here or feel free to just comment along and we'll be showcasing a couple of comments throughout the stream. So without further ado, I think, I think we should introduce our famous people here that we have, right? Hey, let's get it, let's get it. I'm ready for this one. So I have the honor, the absolute honor of introducing you guys to Desiree L. Stage. Now I'm going to bring her on, but she will smile. Yeah. Give me that smile while I introduce this amazing freaking person. So Desiree is an award-winning artist, mom, suicidologist. And she created um, a multimedia storytelling series called Live Through This that aims to reduce prejudice and discrimination against suicide attempt survivors. And through Live Through This, it reminds us that suicide is a human issue by elevating and amplifying survivors' voices through raw, honest stories of survival and pairing them with portraits. So Desiree, um, Desiree's work has been featured in the New York Times, NPR, CNN, Vice News, CBS Evening News, and just, she's, she's just popular, y'all. That's, that's essentially what she means. She's like, I've been everywhere. Everybody know me. Um, and she also produces and co-hosts the video podcast called Suicide and Stuff um, with Jess Stolman Rainey. Oh my God. I was just on that, I think, on Tuesday. Yeah, I was on there on Tuesday mm -hmm. and we had a blast. And our video actually got banned. <laughs> on yeah, Facebook. Oh, we played 40 seconds of WAP. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Every, I'll do it. Everywhere I go, there's just trouble. So <laughs> but yes, that's our um that's Desiree. And so we'll next we'll have Nyla introduce uh Dr. April Alexander. All right. So I am so excited to introduce Dr. April Alexander. Um, she is basically like doing all of the things around here in Denver, Colorado, uh, which is where we both live. Um, so she is an associate professor at the Graduate School of Professional Psychology at the University of Denver, which is one of the best universities in the state. Um, she received her doctorate in clinical psychology from the Florida Institute of Technology, um, where she concentrated in forensic psychology and child and family therapy. So basically like all things, I guess. Um, her research and her clinical work focuses on violence and victimization, human sexuality, and trauma-informed and culturally informed practice. She's also an award-winning researcher um, and like her work has been published in all of these leading journals. In fact, recently she received the 2019 APA Early Career Award um, and the 2020 Michelle Alexander Early Career Award for scholarship and service. Um, Dr. Alexander enjoys bringing psychology to the public through popular culture, which I find to be so cool, especially um, her contributions to these super interesting things called 
the Joker psychology, evil clowns and the women who love them, which after this, I am immediately going to go check that out. And Black Panther psychology, Hidden Kingdoms. Um, and then on top of all of that, uh, Dr. Alexander is also a community organizer with the Black Lives Matter chapter here in Denver. And she serves on the board for the Colorado Juvenile Defender Center and the Colorado Criminal Defense Institute. So safe to say that Dr. Alexander is basically the shit and one of the leading psychologists, I think, in the state, which, you know, is pretty amazing because there are like no black people here in Denver and like especially no black psychologists. So like queen. Anyway, there you Thank go. You. <laughs> yeah. Queen, queen. And Crystal, would you do us the honor of introducing Brandon? Dun, dun. He hails from Baltimore, Maryland. Let's bring him out, folks. Mr. Brandon J. Johnson. Brandon, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. So Brandon is a tireless advocate for positive mental health and suicide prevention services for youth and adults across the country and within the local community of Baltimore, Maryland. Brandon earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Morgan State University in 2008 and a Master's of Health Science from John Hopkins in 2012. Currently, he serves in the federal government working on suicide prevention. He provides guidance to states, tribes, and healthcare systems on suicide prevention initiatives. Another highlight of Brandon's career is his current role as co-lead of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention's Faith Committee's Task Force. Okay, Woo, we got that out. The group works with faith communities all over the nation to equip them with tools and resources to combat the often stigmatized issues of suicide. Brandon has led numerous projects to develop resources and materials to specifically prevent suicide amongst African-American youth. Previously, he served as the director of suicide and violence prevention for the state of Maryland, where he worked in communities throughout the state to help develop strategies to end violence in various forms as, as a, such as community violence and human trafficking. In his role, he has also worked on the Maryland's Governor's Commission on Suicide Prevention, as well as organized the annual Suicide Prevention Conference. Brandon is also the creator of the Black Mental Health Lounge on YouTube. If you guys are not in, get in, okay? He's doing great work over here. And also the Black Mental Health and Healing. Outside of his career, Brandon works with youth as part of the Royal Youth Ministry of Morningstar Baptist Church in Woodland, Maryland. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all of our guests today. Yes, thank you all for being here. So, you guys ready to get this discussion started? Let's get it. Let's get it, Crystal. Let's start it off. All right. So... One of the things that um, we are hearing, and, and as everybody knows on social media, you know, um, suicide prevention is definitely and can be a very controversial um, topic. And so a part of bringing these guys on here today is because I knew that these guys and we knew that these guys would not be afraid to talk a lot about some of those controversial topics. So I, I guess I want to start off with something general. September Suicide Awareness Month. Can you guys give us your perspective on what that means? What is Suicide Awareness Month? What does that even mean? I think like with all of our educational months, it's a time to kind of bring awareness to a particular issue. Uh, so hopefully it's aimed at education on suicide, uh, alleviate the, alleviating the stigma about suicide. Um, but with all kind of awareness months, I think about we need to do this all year round. Anybody else? Yes. I have so many feelings about September. Yeah. That's like the Florida of the calendar. I'd like to cut it off and send it away. Um, <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, there are 11 other months and we should also be focusing on suicide in those 11 other months. Um, it's 
it's nice. Um, I think it would be better, you know, if we could do things like uh, send out some new messages, you know, think a little harder than the usual reach out, speak up. Here's a, here's a crisis number. Uh, otherwise it's just, it's not doing us any good. And I feel like a lot of the people who work in the field by the end of September, we're all tired. We're just over it. And I don't know how much we actually did, you know, how much we achieved. Hmm. So yeah. I have, oh, go for it. No, I was going to say, I totally agree with what, with what they said. And especially about, you know, at the end of September, like we've done a lot of stuff, but it's like, you know, what, you know, what did we really accomplish? You know, how do we move like the needle on suicide prevention forward? And most of it is just like, hey, like suicide is an issue. Thanks for coming to September and Suicide Prevention Month. Um, but it really does have to like, you know, expand past it. And I know we'll get into that conversation, but yeah, I, I totally agree. What was it? So one of the things that, you know, before we kind of get into the to the gut of what we're talking about, I wanted to talk about, and I get, I guess I wanted you guys to kind of educate us and our audience on some of the current suicide rates amongst demographics, populations. Can you guys educate us a little bit in that area so we can kind of get an idea of actually what we're looking at and what we're seeing right now? I mean, I think jumping in, I mean, you know, the thing I, I really just want to throw out that I'll continue to throw out until it gets more uh, notoriety and publicity is that the suicide rates in black children between the ages of five and 12 have doubled in the last 15 years. Um, and also on top of uh, that, we're seeing new data that is showing an increase in suicide attempts that require going to some type of you know, doctor or hospital or emergency or urgent care in black adolescents, or so particularly in our black girls. So we've been seeing this trend for a while. New data shows that that trend is continuing to happen. And so, again, I think, you know, we know some of the, the broader things that are happening about suicide, increasing 10th leading cause of death, over 48,000 people dying per, per year. But when we tease that out, uh, Native Americans, American Indian, Alaska Natives, um, disproportionately high rates, um, and they're increasing in the Latinx population, um, and, and really those two points in black youth suicide I wanted to bring up because um, it doesn't get the attention it needs, and I'll bring it up every single time I have an opportunity to talk about suicide prevention. That's like super, like I've known about that increase in suicide rates for black children for a while, but like no one is talking about it. Like and I usually hate when people say that, when they're like, why is no one talking about this? Because there are usually like people talking about it and they just found yeah. out about it. But like, I feel like this is one of those things where people genuinely are not talking about suicide and young black children. And um, just as someone who has worked in Colorado in school, um, and, you know, with Black and Latinx children, I can say that, you know, working with them, you know, about these issues of sexual assault, which are intimately tied to suicide, I mean, it is a crisis just from what I have seen. And the fact that we're not talking about it because to me feels like people don't see Black children as soft, vulnerable. Um, you know, they feel like they should be able to be resilient against all of the things that are happening to them. And so I feel like that's why we're not having conversations about Black children and suicide. And it's like super ridiculous. But yeah, it's an epidemic and it's terrifying what you just pointed out, all of these uh, rising statistics. Yeah, I mean, just to piggyback off that really quickly, like, you know, I think it's one of those things of, you know, when we, it's, you know, not that people are talking about, it, but people weren't even looking for it. Like someone just happened to stumble across the data. And that again, will, will show you where we are in suicide prevention, where a trend like that could happen over X amount of years. And only when it doubles, do you notice it? Like if that was anything else, most other populations, most other issues, I mean, it would have been timeout, flag on the play, you know, sirens, everything else going yeah. off. But that didn't happen here. And we kind of was like, oh, you know, what happened? Like, how did this, this get here? But if you're not looking for it, 
if you don't think it's a problem in that space, then you're just going to ignore it. And that's what happened. And, you know, there are more people now talking about it than ever, especially with the Congressional Black Caucus work and some of those people. But I mean, legit, it was just like no one was paying attention to it. And it was like all of a sudden, like, here's this big thing that we should should do. And the people still aren't talking about it. So, you know, part of that is the issue of suicide prevention is that certain t- uh, populations are targeted and addressed and others aren't, like just frankly. Yeah. Why do you feel like suicide is such a controversial topic? Like, I mean, like we could probably have an entire episode just based off this question alone, but like, why do you feel like suicide is one of those things that people just don't want to talk about? Um, People have very strong, loud, wrong opinions about it. Um, And it just seems to be like in the field of mental health, like we can talk about a lot, but getting to this space where we're talking about suicide feels impossible. Um, What are y'all thoughts on that? I'd kind of like to hear from all three of you on this one. Yeah, I think it's that myth that if we talk about suicide or we talk about sex, then that'll promote people to engage in sex or to want to uh, try to attempt suicide. And that's simply not true. And so by avoiding those topics, we're just pushing our youth, especially um, out of the conversation about mental health. Um, That's what's creating the stigma that if we talk about it, uh, will that give our youth ideas? Um, instead of thinking about, we need to talk about it because our youth are already experiencing these um, ideations of suicide. Um, and so I think it's so important to remove that stigma and kind of normalize some of this conversation that, um, uh, again, we need to talk about when we're not doing well and having that conversation. Uh, it's so interesting when uh, sometimes I tell people, yeah, I'm not doing okay today. They can't even handle the conversation. They try to switch to something new or ignore uh, what my experience is. Um, And that's not okay. That's where we're kind of failing our young people and failing our adults um, in this conversation. Um, Hello. I think, (laughs) for me, I feel like what I'm noticing a lot of is is fear. And I think the fear uh, simultaneously pushes us away and pulls us in. Um, And and what I mean by that is, you know, you've got the whole suicide prevention field is driven by fear. They say, don't normalize it. Uh, You know, silence the the people who have experienced the the attempt survivors, the the lost survivors. don't don't talk about it. And then on the other side, you've got everything on your TV has suicide in it. Every Disney movie has the word suicide in it somehow, or all the ones I'm watching. And I'm watching like Moana. Um, uh, TV, songs, podcasts, it's everywhere. We really want to talk about it. And I can, but we don't know how. Um, so it comes up, it comes up in art a lot. Um, and I can tell you like, Suicides come up in the weirdest conversations for me. Uh, you know, people ask me, what do you do? And outside of a strip club, when I'm getting a puppy, when I'm opening a bank account, I say suicide, they're like, I knew somebody, or I've been there, or something like that. And I mean, it's it's really interesting, but I think it's that fear piece. Yeah. I want to come back to the Disney thing later, but no way to remember. Yeah. <laughs> Well, before Brandon starts, I want to understand a little bit more, Desiree, why do you think, or anybody, why do you think is such fear? You know, who's driving the fear? Um, are we as the clinicians driving the fear? Are the the individuals who are experiencing this, experiencing this driving the fear? And I'm definitely interested on kind of hearing that, especially as a clinician as well, who works with individuals who do struggle with suicidality. So help me understand that fear factor and where you kind of feel like that's coming from. For me, I think, I think it's the clinicians. I don't think it's the people um, who are, who are experiencing it unless they're so, you know, unless they've just internalized that stigma from, from clinicians and from the field. Um, You know, I'm in an MSW program right now and it comes down to, we don't, we don't think about it at all, but you know, I had to do a role play through paperwork the other day and it's like, uh, we'll hospitalize you if you're suicidal. And it's just like, wait, but we're not going to have a conversation about it first. Like what, you're just going to hospitalize someone. Do you even know what the spectrum of suicidal thoughts looks like? You're not going to explore that. You're just going to be afraid of liability and hand a, a 
person who might just be kind of having a little bit of an existential crisis off to the next person. Um, and it doesn't help that none of us are really trained, you know, I, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I've got a whole, a whole issue brief that I wrote about how, um, most of the, the clinicians in, in the U S are not trained like social workers who make up the most of the, the mental health workforce, less than four hours of training on average across the country. And that's, that's a problem. Of course, our fear is going to drive us because we don't want someone to die. And if we don't know what to do, how are we going to feel like? we're able to help them, you know? I mean, it makes sense, but it's also infuriating. I, I would definitely agree when I say that as clinicians, I feel like we are taught safety first at all times, right? And so it is like, if someone comes into your office suicidal, the first thing you wanna do is, okay, so what do we need to do? Let's let's do the safety plan. I struggle with the safety plans. And that's one of the questions we are gonna talk about these safety plan things, but certain organizations require you to do these things, right? And so the first thing we're doing is worrying about how are we gonna prevent someone from hurting themselves, right? Instead of being being in that moment with that person and understanding why they want to hurt themselves. And I would say as a young clinician 13 years ago, you know, 10 years ago, I was that clinician, like not listening to the person, but actually just trying to save them. Right. So now as a more seasoned clinician, as I teach my younger clinicians and, and you know, when they're in that panic mode and I'm like, just chill out for a second, just chill out for a second. We, we'll figure this out. Right. Because when we really get into the depths of what's happening with somebody, when they when you sit there and after 20, 30 minutes and you're kind of listening to it, it's like, OK, there's no plan or intent to do this. This, this is my baseline. Right. And I think we're not taught as clinicians how to deal with people who struggle with suicidality as a baseline. Right. Because if that's your baseline, then that means that the likelihood that you're going to be suicidal more often is higher than someone who doesn't have a baseline of suicidality. So I agree. We need more training as clinicians to deal with, honestly, the fear part. Right. Mm -hmm. And the judgment part of suicidality in our yeah. client. And we're getting some. Absolutely. Because the, the way in which we're trained is uh, yeah. you're a mandatory reporter. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing you need to do and you need to document and you need to call somebody ASAP instead of, like you said, sitting with the client, um, listening to the words. Uh, if you kind of mm -hmm. calm down yourself and start listening to this person's story, um, it's usually not something that is mm -hmm. going to escalate to immediately calling mm -hmm. law enforcement and having mm -hmm. a hold. Um, and so having that space to kind of just process what's going on in the room and how you both are feeling is just so critical. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. We're getting a couple of great comments on social media too. I'd love to share with you guys. Yeah, let's do it. So we got some comments from Facebook. Like the fear comes from the lack of control people feel when someone says they want to die. Many people automatically go to the need. I need to stop you from dying. And they resort to 911 without having an actual conversation. This leads to people who are suicidal to not want to say anything. And some more comments from um, Facebook. Um, this is about uh, who's driving the fear. Um, so we got a comment from Seymour123 saying that clinicians for sure are driving the fear. Um, liability, fear of clients dying. And on YouTube, we got a comment from Robin saying, agreed, my therapist always redirects to how I can stop feeling that way instead of creating a space to talk about it. Exactly, exactly. And, and I'm, and I'm going to move out the way, but I want to make one more comment about this as a clinician. It's almost like when you have an individual in your office that may be some type, experiencing some type of break, right? And that break can be, let's just go extreme, whether that be a psychotic break or not. We're not going to automatically just cut the member or the patient, the client off. Right. I'm going to sit with that client when they're having that break so that I can understand exactly what's going on right here. What those voices may be telling that person to do versus what is not telling them to do. I'm not going to panic as the clinician, but I do think that comes with experience over time. And that does come come with, you know, being in an organization that actually supports, you know, different types of responses to um, our clients that are struggling with suicidality. So I'm going to treat that person the same way that I would with any client that I'm listening to that needs to bring all of that energy out to the forefront so I can actually hear it. Uh, I have a question um, for you guys. So like, 
sort of like this this concept that like oh we have to like stop people from feeling suicidal at all costs um for me as someone who struggles with you know suicidal ideation and attempts like it's always super invalidating to me when i am telling someone like this is why i want to die for x y z reasons and they sort of act as though i'm not feeling that as though that's not logical to like feel like this makes me not want to be here anymore um you know just like the platitudes of like push through it or it gets better and i feel like for me i feel like it's very controversial and it kind of relates to this thing that bothers me with like this deification of therapy right like therapists always know better uh or therapists always know best or like therapy will fix you but i feel like there isn't a lot of conversation about sometimes clinicians interventions can actually increase those feelings of suicide um like the platitudes they can increase it for me because like i know you're lying like i know like this particular part of my life may not get better for a long time or like no actually this is a super traumatic thing and it actually does make sense that i don't want to be here anymore um and then sometimes like you said you know calling um authorities are calling people in i remember one time i was handcuffed like and i struggled with it for like it it increased my like suicidal uh suicidality by like i i don't even know how much just that experience with law enforcement um so how do you think that you know and again controversial because people don't really want to say that therapists or psychologists can be wrong but like how do you think that like therapists can actually increase that suicidal um suicidality in their patients by their decisions you know one thing we have to remember is you're the expert in your own life um so one of the things i heard you say is uh it's feeling invalidating uh so some of the recommendations that a therapist might get th that uh that might be invalidating you might have already tried uh so making the assumption that you haven't already tried some of these things without asking the client uh, what they want in that moment. Uh, what is it that you hope that I can hear from you in that moment, I think is so important. Uh, because when people come to tr uh, therapy, it's usually because they did try um, several different things first. Um, so again, I think it is taking that step back, like Dr. Crystal said, and having that space for dialogue first before thinking about what are next steps for an actual clinical intervention. Yeah. Yes, Dr. April. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And I think it is particularly troubling when the focus is on, you know, how do I make sure I handle this in a way that something doesn't happen that I'm liable for, that I'm held held liable for, and compassion and empathy kind of take that that back seat because we we do know like those platitudes and things that you're talking about, like especially for um, you know, for, for people in situations where, like you said, this may not, you know, get better for a while. There are systemic things that people are dealing with that we're not just going to change, you know, like that. And so sitting with a person when they're in that, when they're going through that is, is very different than, you know, like, how do we fix you while dealing with a system that, you know, we don't want to fix or we can't fix immediately um, you know, I think is 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 harmful for people like, you know, and that invalidation, you know, causes more stress and anxiety. And so I think like, you know, making sure that we can, you know, talk about, you know, empathy and, you know, humility and compassion as we as we deal with this, because so much of it is, you know, centered on therapeutic process. And how do I make sure that I'm not going to lose my licensure or something like this doesn't happen? We have to be realistic and holistic about like the society that we live in. There are some things that are, you know, set up structurally that, you know, is going to be harmful for a, per for a person that goes beyond like, you know, just, you know, mental health diagnosis. So how do we help people, you know, like deal with life? Like life is, is so, you know, so complicated. And I think having that humility of, you know, knowing that there are going to be some moments where, you know, your therapeutic technique isn't what a person needs not your 911 call isn't what a person needs, but 
your you know empathy and humility in that moment is is, is way more important. Oh my goodness. I agree with it. I know we got to move on to the next question, y'all. But see, I knew this was going to happen. Um, and so I agree with that, um, Brandon. And even a lot of times, you know, and this can be dependent on the clinician, they can have an issue with me doing this. When a person is suicidal and they come into my office and they tell me that, I will ask them, so why didn't you do it? Right? And a part of that is to understand protective factors that a person has to support them going forward. Some people will be like, why would you ask them that? Right. And that's a part of establishing protective factors to help this person continue to move forward and not want to take their life. But that is also something that a lot of clinicians may not ask. I'm not sure if Dr. April, you know, has asked her clients that or if that's something that, you know, she's done in the past. But that question, you know, I get a lot of eyebrows about that question. But I use that, first of all, as a, a honest and straightforward direct. I want to know why you didn't do it. I want to know because that why is probably what's going to help me help you stay safe. I do ask that question. Um, you know, I, I think it's a strength that that person came into session mm -hmm. today. Uh, so getting some, um, having some dialogue about what brought you mm -hmm. here, uh, so something kept you from engaging in that behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something within you that did have some form of hope and um, strength. Um, and so uh, it's not to reframe it in a ignoring manner, but it is to kind of figure out uh, what are those, like you said, protective factors. What are those protective factors that did keep you safe in that moment and how can we continue those? You know, it's interesting for me because when I've actually never been asked that question, but I've often thought about it because I I had my first attempt at 11 and my mother would constantly like say I was faking. You know what I mean? And um, so it after every attempt, I would always like take stock in my mind. Like, why didn't I? follow through or why did I choose a method that I knew, you know, had a low success rate or, you know, like there were, I would always wonder. And for me, the root of it was never hope. Um, it was always fear. It was always fear of what people would say about me. Um, the lack of control I would have over my own story, uh, not knowing what comes after life like not knowing what comes after death, um, fear of it hurting, like fear of certain methods hurting, fear of fear of the fear making me call 911. Like it's, it's never been hope that has stopped me. I just, I don't know what the question there is, but like, I think that that's something in my, in, in my experience, it's never been hope. It's always been this fear of, of judgment and um, of the unknown and also of my response to my own, you know, physical pain. Uh -oh. Yeah, I can second that. I don't think I ever stayed because I felt hopeful because I wouldn't have wanted to go if I felt hopeful. Um, yeah, yeah, it's that fear, just like what's gonna happen. Um, but it, it was fear that made me want to go too. So it's like, you know, ah, what does it mean? Um, but definitely uh, that ambivalence. I think the ambivalence is the piece that kind of makes people reach out. Um, so they don't really want to stay, but they don't they they don't know what to do, and they're they're afraid to go. Um, and so it's like, all right, well, I guess <laughs> I guess I ask for help or something, and and maybe I'll I'll get some sort of answer that will help clarify. Um, but definitely that that fear piece, the fear so, all around. I, just to, so I would like to just kind of ask the question of, you know, there's a myth that when we hear someone's story about suicide and that it's going to put things in people's minds and make them want to um, try to take their life. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Um, is that a fact? Is it a myth? Do you feel like people coming forward and telling their stories is helpful? Can you guys speak on that a little bit? I just want to pop in and say I'd really like to hear what 
Dr. Alexander has to say about pop culture and TV's role in this and suicide contagion, so. Oh gosh, that gets complicated. <laughs> um, but uh, again, talking about it doesn't cause uh, adolescents to want to engage in it. And so what happens is if a friend uh, uh, dies by suicide or we hear about suicidal ideation, the whole community shuts down. So I hear from a lot of students that my teacher doesn't want to talk about it. My parents don't want to talk about it. And so uh, again, I think it's that fear of fear now. Why, why aren't people wanting to talk about what happened to my friend? Uh, what resources can I get? And so, yeah, it's this misconception that by not talking about it, it'll just go away. And it doesn't. Uh, that people sit with that. Um, and that doesn't help our kids uh, think about how do they get care for themselves if they're in a similar situation. Uh, the pop culture thing gets tricky too in some of this discussion because uh, the, the presentation I wanted to do at Pop Culture Con is having a dialogue about uh, glorification. Um, is our media kind of glorifying suicide, especially when we were talking about 13 Reasons Why? Uh, was it opening up a dialogue about mental health or was it glorification? Uh, and there were so many mixed opinions uh, about that kind of very topic. Uh, but what what we saw is there were no supports for children who were watching that material. And that's where it became dangerous. Um, that at first we didn't have the suicide hotlines tagged on there, or there was no dialogue with uh, an adult or a peer about what they were seeing. And so that's where it gets messy when we're avoiding the larger conversation. Brandon, you want to go? Yeah. Okay. I mean, and I think, yeah, I, I got it. So I think that's, you know, exactly what happens. I think Dr. April was right on it. Like what, you know, the the issue is, especially, you know, again, I, I talk a lot about suicide among people of of, of color, um, you know, BIPOC or however you're supposed to say it, <laughs> you know, because that's where, you know, I focus a lot of um, my work, like even in, in the community. And there's so much like, um, you know, there's so much concern about what the story is going to lead to. And, you know, when people share those things. I mean, a lot of it is just that people are, you know, have a hard time hearing it. Like that's literally, I think a big piece of it is that so many people have a hard time hearing it. And I don't think that we would, if we allow people to open up and talk about it. I've seen so much impact happen from, from people, especially in our community to talk about their experiences with it, to talk about what they experienced with their friends um, or their loved ones. Like that is really what drives people to open up, communicate, <clears throat> to share how how they you know were able to you know to manage in that moment and to talk about what this looks like in different places. Like some places have been so conditioned that it's such a horrible thing to mention or or utter the word that I know I've known many a story of people who have died by suicide where um, the family would you know either try to conceal it or they would change literally what happened. Um, you know, and it's really kept people from from opening up and, and having these conversations and understanding that this is something that happens and it may look different depending on where you are and what community you're a part of. And I think that, you know, a lot of it is just that the people who experience these things, like they they want to talk about it, like they're fine sharing it, but it's everybody else that's just like, oh my God, it's that thing again. And it's like, if we, you know, were supportive and used it to help other people, we wouldn't have this like, you know, this feeling around it that we couldn't uh, approach this topic. So I really think it's it's us. It's an us issue, not individuals who experience this. Y'all know how I feel about stories. <laughs> yes, we do. I think personal <laughs> stories are the most powerful thing we have in changing um, people's views about suicide. Uh, you know, I run a website called Live Through This that I, where I've interviewed like 200 suicide attempt survivors. And the interesting thing to me is that usually when I'm sitting down with people, they don't know me and I don't know them. And what I hear is that I'm the first person who wanted to hear their whole story. Um, and then when we're done, you know, they feel like something has changed. Maybe something's lifted. And a lot of them go and, and they continue to tell their stories. They're more open about it in their lives or they do media or, you know, whatever. They're, they're really active advocates. And um, I think that really changes um, other people's attitudes, people who haven't been through it. And I think I would put money on the fact that suicide, suicide rates are going up because people with lived experience haven't been involved enough. I think it will 
the whole the whole thing will change when we start including attempt survivors and people with lived experience um, everywhere, everywhere we go. I totally, I, I will say um, in my organization, we did something for the first time where we allowed people to share their stories. And um, when that happened, when I say we were flooded with people coming in to seek support, it was overwhelming. So um, yeah, and that was my first experience with something like that as well. So I, I, I do agree, it's something to be said for someone to be able to tell their story and, and encourage someone else to come get help. One of the things that I'll, I'll be honest with that was really new to me per se, or probably just be just admitting my ignorance to it, um, is when we say committed suicide or died by suicide. I want you guys to talk about that and why is there such a difference in how we should be saying that and using that language? You know, uh, today the Denver Post just launched a series about uh, youth suicide uh, because youth suicide is the leading cause of death among young people in Colorado. Um, and I think language is so important. Uh, you know, committed suicide. Uh, it, we're treating it as if it's a crime. Um, and even here in Colorado, we had the issue of when a person was expressing suicidal ideation, the police were showing up. So you are criminalizing mental health and you are criminalizing suicidal ideation. Um, and that's just not fair. Um, and that hurts the way in which people are willing to talk about uh, their mental health concerns. Uh, so again, I think that's like, that language is important. Some people are like, oh, it's not a big deal, but it really is a big deal. Um, and, and treating it as a death, treating it as a public health concern, rather than trying to do this criminalization uh, that we see with so many other kind of conditions of poverty, of mental health, and other uh, types of things in our society. Yeah. It is definitely like, you know, there's an illness and, you know, you died of that illness. And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of it and all. Um, I mean, obviously, like, not to simplify it, but, you know, it's at, it's, on one hand, it's very simple. And on the other hand, it is very complicated. And what I mean by simple is that people have illnesses, people die from illnesses. And I feel like making suicide less of this horrific, mystical, um, you know, you know, like, horror trope helps people to be less scared of it. Um, and I think that's kind of why people either toggle between, you know, glorifying it, right? Because we glorify and, you know, what we're scared of. That's like the entire reason why we watch horror movies, right? Um, and, or, you know, criminalizing it and saying like, this person was doing it, you know, for, attention. This person was doing it to get back at someone. This person, uh, you know, was doing it because they're a bad person or because they neglected to like care for themselves. Um, because I think that all of that is us just trying to make sense of what, you know, since human history, people have had a hard time understanding why someone would try to kill themselves, why someone would want to kill themselves. So, you know, Desiree, that's why I super agree with you that when people who actually can can articulate this and actually can verbalize this and say, this is how I felt, then it will can speak out and lead these conversations, then it will change. Um, I also think, you know, one thing that I talk about is this field, psychiatry, psychology is so new. It's It's so new. Um, and so like, sometimes it's really refreshing when you hear clinicians just admit that they don't know what the fuck they're talking about and maybe they need to like learn more, you know? And I think it puts everyone at ease when we recognize, you know, maybe this person doesn't know. And then, you know, maybe we don't have all the answers. This is, you know, psychiatry in particular is more of an art than a science at this point. And admitting the areas that we don't know frees up spaces for that conversation instead of just this rigid, rigid understanding of what people think suicide is all about. And so I guess like we've been talking about so many of 
what's wrong with suicide prevention um, nowadays. But I guess I kind of want to know what is working or, or what has potential um, in you guys' opinion. You know, we've talked about so much of what's wrong, but what's working in what you, um, in your opinion? Yes, <laughs> that's a, that's his uh, face. <laughs> the, the silence was, yeah, it was exactly I that. Nothing, but that's how I feel too. But go ahead. <laughs> you know, that's exactly where I was going to go with it. Like you know, we talk about you know, I I think what you said, like your last point about suicide. You know, the the field in general, like talking about and being open about what we don't know. I think that's the first step to us getting somewhere, I think in, in suicide prevention is for so many people and you know, and experts and the people we hear from a lot, like is saying like, there's so much that we don't know. There's so much that we don't have a handle on. And I think it would be like refreshing for us to just say that in some of these spaces and try to, you know, do something different and try to move, you know, you know, and, 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 and move the dial on this. And so, you know, it's really for me and the things that I've seen um, around is really centered around what's happening on the local levels in communities where communities have autonomy to create, uh, you know, interventions and prevention strategies, particularly for the people that they work with and understanding what they need and hearing from them and letting them drive the work. So, like, there's a lot of stuff like on on local levels that are really taking place that um, that are, are, are really good. I mean, I think in American Indian, Alaska Native country and working with some of the tribes that I work with, um, they are coming up with their own stuff that fits what they do in their culture and their language with their traditions and their practices. And they're able to have impact because they're able to do this and say, you know, again, like we talked about earlier, we're the experts of our space. We understand what our culture is and how that's a protective factor in and of itself. And so we're able to build this stuff. Like when communities have the ability to create their own, like they can, you know, finance it or wherever they get financing from and, and kind of build something out based on what the community needs with the community leaders at the helm and the people in the community having voice and the process of figuring out how to solve a problem comes from within, that's where we have impact. Like I think that's where we are able to see things change is when these communities are able to do this. And so by far in my space, and, you know, especially in the, the, you know, places of different cultures or people of different backgrounds, that absolutely, when culture is brought into it, when autonomy is, is a part of it, when they have their own ownership and leadership, I think that those have been the places I've seen the most uh, promising change in suicide prevention. Autonomy is the big one for me. Like that, to me, that's the, that's just like, there's nothing more important than that. But there are a lot of Africans on this chat right now. And I love what you brought up about culture. So how do you feel like the black community, like what do you think are our protective factors? What are what are parts of our culture where, where we can use that to address this issue? Yeah, and I want to pivot off of Brandon. You know, first, um, anytime we have a budget, it's mental health, substance abuse, and suicide prevention and intervention that gets cut first. So oftentimes, that's why we don't know what works because, uh, like Brandon said, at the local level, we'll implement something and then it's cut two years down the line once that funding cycle runs out. Um, but there are so many different things that people are trying to do at the local level. Um, I've seen people modify uh, mental health first aid, uh, like Brandon said, for indigenous communities, for the Latinx communities. And for black communities, we know that things like sister circles are really helpful in mental health. Uh, that having that sisterhood to come together and talk about issues in the community that affect uh, black women and black femmes is so powerful. Knowing that uh, embracing kinship families, uh, so people who are outside of your family or of origin or biological family, all of those things that we know are kind of intrinsic, inherent to our culture can be used in this fight uh, of kind of tackling mental health issues and the stigma in our community. So we need to figure out uh, kind of culturally humble ways to embrace that and put it back into a lot of these interventions. Uh, the problem is again, uh, who's developing them? Uh, we need more people in the pipeline to help develop these interventions, whether it's people who've been impacted by suicidal ideation or more mental health practitioners of color doing the work as well and funding them. 
I'm also going to throw out there like non-Christian, obviously like a lot of people in the black community are Christian, but I feel like embracing non-Christian ideas of death and birth um, and the cycles of life are really, really helpful. Christian theology around these things can be very punitive, very black and white. And that, that, that I feel like has hurt our community. Um, not to say like we should all just stop being Christians, but like I do feel like allowing for, you know, some of those other traditions and other ideas to come into other people's practice can help. I know that when I speak to people who are, you know, practitioners of Santeria, like they have um, a perspective that I feel could help a lot of us as well. Yeah, we have to recognize that psychology is still like a very Western medicine. Mm -hmm. And so I've been learning a lot locally here in Denver from healers. Uh, so thinking about other methods that are effective in healing, whether it's acupuncture or massage um, or crystals. Um, so for me, I'm having to work uh, with that population to figure out how to provide actually holistic care um, that uh, some of the resources that we have within the community might be Christian based and that might not fit everybody's model of learning. Um, or healing. And so uh, we do need to step out aside some of those uh, Western Judeo-Christian kind of frameworks. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I do want to say too, like there's the uh, Black Mental Health Alliance that is based here in, in Baltimore. And so like they do uh, trauma healing circles. And so it's uh, African origin, but it really has people to talk about, you know, a collective trauma and things. And it really, I can't say that they started it because of the killing of Freddie Gray here in Baltimore um, at the hands of the police. But they went all in like when when that happened. And it was so powerful, like, you know, attending a couple of those and having people around like really, you know, really there and seeing that like collective trauma uh, being addressed and so much like came out of it. And it was such a, um, you know, a beautiful thing to see. And so I think that's another one, like those healing circles um, you know, are definitely another powerful space for us. Yeah, Brandon, tonight uh, there's like a black trauma-informed yoga um, that's gonna be virtual. Right. And uh, again, people are trying to find all these other forms of healing and during COVID-19, trying to bring it to the virtual spaces. I, I can't attend, but I know it's tonight and that's something else that can aid in our care. For well, sure. I think we had some comments from the audience um, cause we've been having some good conversations. So I feel like they have some stuff to say, Ashley. Yeah. So we have another comment from Isabel, um, in the black and Latinx community, pr protective factors like religion and family can also become risk factors. It's complex. I think that was related to what you were saying, Nyla, about how, um, religion can also have an impact on, uh, suicidality. It is tough. Like I work in um, like that intersection of faith and mental health. I mean, suicide prevention, like it's it's tough. And there's so much that, you know, there's so much unlearning that we got to do in right. that space as well, especially now that like you were talking about it being punitive. I mean, there's still plenty of conversations or, you know, it's just like, as soon as you mentioned suicide, it's like, hell is the first word right behind it. Just like immediately. Yeah. And still like trying to like break down, you know, break down those things because it can be, a powerful thing, but just like the commenter said, like it can be detrimental. And there's been, you know, again, church hurt, especially with the, you know, LGBTQ2 spirit community that has to happen as well in order to work on these things. So then I think it it, it takes time and it's going to take time, but totally, totally get it. Mm, yeah. I think there uh, are more comments too. Yeah. Or I was also hearing Nyla in those kind of tropes, uh, the strong black woman. Um, and so, you know, Yes, we embrace that uh, to you know have positive self-talk, but also that could be harmful. I, I can't always be strong. And so I correct people when they try to put that label on me. Uh, yeah, there might some, be some good examples of that, but yeah, sometimes I'm not doing well and that's okay in this moment in time. I shouldn't be feeling well uh, with the ruling of Breonna Taylor. Like that's, that's how I feel. Uh, so making sure we're not invalidating people through these tropes. I'm not strong. I, I get through life either from spite or just like television. Like that's how I've been coasting. Like it's one of those two. Like there's right. strength in here. Like sometimes I'd be like, you know what? I just really don't like that person. And that's why I'm going to do well because I just, I just want them to be jealous of me. I'm not strong. Mm -mm, no, I rebuke that. <laughs> no. 
But well, yeah, can somebody say something about like we need uh, interventions outside of the faith community and that and how um, harmful that can be for LGBTQI plus people. Um, and I totally agree with that. Like, you know, we just we need a combination of we need a combination of um, interventions and solutions. And I think kind of the common thread between what we've all been saying, um, telling stories, you know, uh, choosing our, you, you know, like thinking about religion deeper, um, questioning clinicians and feeling like you can actually speak up. All of that has to do with autonomy. So I feel like we're all kind of like, we've said so many different things, but I feel like what I've heard is that it all comes back um, to autonomy. I don't know. I don't know. All right, so um, actually a few more comments before we allow the guests to kind of give their final uh, words. Yeah, we had this one from um, Crystal, um, just related to um, faith institutions. Uh, she says, we need more interventions that aren't focused on faith institutions. Some of these places can be dangerous for the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and then we have a comment from uh, Nolan um, that says, there is power in the stories of recovery and community. And so with keeping that in mind, I would like to know, since we, we have only a couple minutes left here, um, are there ways that we can change like our current suicide prevention efforts or even just the messaging for suicide prevention? Like what can we change? Yes. I think, I think people with lived experience should, should be encouraged to tell their stories. Um, I especially think clinicians and professionals, I fucking hate professionalism, um, people with letters and whatever and, and jobs <laughs> um, should come out if they can. I think it's a, a privilege to have that position um, and a privilege to be able to keep um, your lived experience inside, but I also think it's harmful to to the clinician or to the professional and, and to that trickles down to the people that, that the clinician is helping. Um, and so I feel like if you can tell your story, um, that that part is the biggest part for me. April or Brandon? Yeah, I agree with Des. Um, spending more time listening to people with lived experience uh, and their stories is just so key uh, that we know there are people or professionals, Des, uh, who have these stories. I, I hear it from my students. Uh, but again, some of that stigma forces them to close down and not tell their own story as they want to engage in this work. And I think that's so key. Um, and then again, as we were talking at the end about BIPOC communities and LGBTQIA plus communities, uh, there are people who are wanting to do better. Uh, there are people who will provide you with better culturally informed care um, unfortunately, it's sometimes finding the right person or finding the right space. And that could be really difficult, especially in rural communities. Um, and so, you know, uh, finding, uh, again, I know somebody posted the BIPOC uh, hotline out there, therapy for black girls. There's a lot of people out there trying to do better um, in this work. And I do think, Dr. April, just to piggyback real quick before Brandon, is it is institutional too, right? Depending on how you're working and what space you're working in as a clinician, it can be really difficult to be more, like I like to call myself, liberal in my practice, right? I work in a very structured organization. Right. And so a lot of times some of these things I want to, you know, want to bring to the table may not always be received in a certain way. So, um, yeah, all that. Thank you. All that. All that. Brandon. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I agree with everything that was said um, as well. I think we, you know, we do need more voices of lived experience because, again, I think part of what the field needs to do is to sit back and, you know, think about like, you know, all these like experts and letters behind our name and years of experience and say, you know, just have a really hard look in the mirror and say, you know, we're not moving the, the, the needle. Like the things that we consistently always do aren't working. So why not go to some places that are doing things different? Why not hear from the people who experience it 
why not, you know, let them, you know, not just hear from them because there's a lot of check boxes going on. Oh, you know, we have a personal living experience here, so we've done it. But to really, um, you know, let them drive, um, you know, what practice should be, what intervention and prevention to look like is definitely key. And going to some of these places that I mentioned earlier that are having an impact, but, you know, where the funding never lands, right? It never quite gets to these communities and they're doing some some amazing stuff like how can we take that and amplify it and and give them voice and not be predatory about it but give them voice and see how we can um, take what's working to other places and so um, i think that's really where it needs to start like we have to have a hard conversation you know and we're you know doing a lot of you know patting ourselves on the back but we need to have a hard look in the mirror and say we're not doing enough we're not doing things some of the things that we consistently have done, we need to look at and see if we can change it and get in some different uh, different people there to uh, you know to really drive some change. But that that would be what I would say. Great, thank you. Can I add one more thing since I remembered what the thing was? Yes. So small people started screaming. Go ahead. This this whole chat right here. This is the shit that needs to be happening. I'm so sick of old straight white people. Like I like that I'm the only white person here like, I like we all that. just need to shut the fuck up just <laughs> shut up i agree i've been saying that for like a week on twitter i'm like just go away i am so busy. just take a nap just just oh a nap <laughs> tyranny <laughs> and not well thank I you like we need a part two because i mm. have so many more questions um yeah, so we got to figure that out. But go ahead. Ask yeah, we're going to handle it. We're going to organize a part two because, I, part I two. mean, it's you can't really discuss suicide prevention in one hour. Like, you you honestly probably need, like, 10 years to discuss this thing. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll definitely set up a set uh, a part two um, with our current panelists and maybe add some more folks to mm -hmm. it. Uh, but as we are nearing the end of the stream, we sadly must say goodbye. Um, so just want to say thank you to Brandon, uh, Brandon Johnson, Dr. April Alexander, and Desiree L. Stage for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I know it's really hard um, right now, and everyone's really pressed for time since we're literally living and working from home nowadays. So I just really appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedules to talk with us and our lovely audience today. And for next week, uh, we will actually not be having a show. So SPSM is on this lovely new schedule where we are doing three shows a month. Ah, yeah. and that's because we all have lives and we need breaks. So, <laughs> so to avoid burnout, we have three shows a I month. I like this TV. <laughs> yeah, we need a TV day. We all well, need a TV I'll be day. traveling. And from, I'll be having some sun next week in California, IA. So I'm excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> right. I'm in California, so Crystal, make sure you come by. Man, I'm going south. I'm going to San Diego, man. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. We could have met up. We could have. I know. I know. <laughs> well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, we'll be back with our next show on Sunday, October 11th at our new time, 2 p.m. Pacific and 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, any last words from anybody? Mic drop, boom. Boom. Just stay Bye. tuned. Thank you guys so much. Stay tuned for part two and thanks for joining us. Have a good evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.